So I didn't report this story at the time, man, but a couple months ago, as some of you guys probably already know, one of the last living Chicago outfit, uh, former hitmen or contract killers, Nick Calabrese died. And he was a very instrumental figure in the uh, in bringing down the mob in the Family Secrets trial uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, for those of you young guys who don't know what that was, that was a huge trial of a lot of top level mobsters here in Chicago that basically... It was kind of like the nail in the coffin for the mafia in Chicago. I mean, it brought down a lot of bosses, a lot of top-level guys. And um, Nick Calabrese cooperating with the government was one of the big uh, pieces of that. Um, this guy, he actually, he had a very interesting life. Uh, he grew up in Chicago, uh, worked over by, I think it was State and Grand um, at like a newsstand when he was young. He was a Vietnam vet, worked for a time at a detective agency, actually. And um, then he got a union job and he, uh, he worked as a security guard and done a bunch of stuff, but uh, he had eventually gotten involved in a, in a loan sharking business. And what that is, that's a big hustle that the mob used to do, which is basically they would lend guys money, um, but at these huge inter interest rates. Uh, I think Calabrese's crew was charging like 10% per week uh, for loans that they would give people. And uh, it was a big money maker. He was working with his brother, a guy named Frank Calabrese Sr. And Frank Calabrese Sr. is another notorious uh, mob figure. This guy, Nick Calabrese, though, he, he eventually confessed to taking part in 14 murders. And these murders were um, ordered in, in the mob. It, you know, you just, you don't just like spot an op and then shoot. This is, it all has to be ordered from like the top down. You have to get the okay from the boss to kill somebody before you kill somebody. And these, these hits um, were done on the orders of his boss. And at that time, his boss was a capo named Angelo uh, La Pietra. His street name was The Hook. And uh, the particular mob crew that he was a part of was the 26th Street Crew. Now, the son, I think, of Frank Calabrese uh, Sr., I want to say Calabrese Jr., who was also another uh, guy who cooperated with the government, uh, he, I think, is was part of the Chinatown crew, which um, the... Chicago Outfit had like, I forget the exact number of crews, but they had like an Elmwood Park crew, a Cicero crew, Chinatown crew. So it spans city and suburbs. It's like split up, but it's all basically one organization. Like don't think that those are different gangs or something. It's it's all one uh, Chicago Outfit group. They had their headquarters over at this place called the Old Neighborhood Italian American Club. And uh, Angelo Piet La Pietra, he was the boss of this. So... You know, all these murders, um, Calabrese confessed to taking part in 14 of them. But the big one that brought him down was the murder of a guy named John, John Fecarota, who was actually a, a mob figure himself. Uh, and as you guys probably already know, the mob, you know, they're notorious for killing their own people, uh, killing their own guys for one reason or another. Um, one of my former neighbors, a guy named Ken Ito, he wasn't Italian, he was actually Japanese, but he was working for the mob. Uh, they tried to hit him. Well, they tried to kill him. They did hit him up um, right like down the street from my house. And um, he survived, though. And uh, so, you know, I think there's this slang today, Italian beef, you know, where guys are like going at going at each other. And this is like kind of a it's kind of a messed up situation that just kind of exposes how there's really no love or loyalty in it. These are not like brothers, you know what I'm saying? Because they're whacking each other left and right. And uh, so John Fecarota, he was a, he was another mob guy. And uh, Calabrese took part in that. He also was part of a, a really big group of guys, actually, that took part in the murder of uh, Tony's Palatro. And uh, that, that was a famous incident. Now, the way that it was portrayed in the movies was not accurate. It was a little different than that. Calabrese had done time in prison. Um, I think his sentence was about 70 months back in 95 for racketeering. But uh, he had actually been taken out of like the federal prison system and all his records kind of disappeared. And so it was like something was going on and he was cooperating with the government at that point. And uh, the reason why he started cooperating with the government, they brought him uh, a bloody glove that he had accidentally dropped at the scene of the John Fecarota murder. So... You know, he was being confronted basically with like evidence that he couldn't beat. Now they have DNA evidence and everything. So he was going to do life in prison. He eventually got sentenced to 12 years, but um, he had done all this other stuff. I mean, he was getting plenty of money from his other jobs. 
but um, he went that route and uh, eventually, you know, turned on the organization, uh, as did Frank Calabrese Jr. And the judge was saying, you know, at his sentencing that uh, he was explaining to kind of the, vic the, the victim's families that the reason why this guy's only getting 12, 12 years is because of his cooperation. And if, you know, you don't like the fact that he's only getting 12 years after taking part in the murder of your relative, just know that if he hadn't done that, you know, none of these other guys would be facing this time. And uh, some of them were facing life. That's just something that the government has to give up. But the judge noted, he's like, well, but you're going to have to look over your shoulder for the rest of your life because the organization that you've turned on now, you know, might be out to kill you. So Frank Calabrese Jr., he's addressed that. And this guy, Frank, Cal uh, Frank uh, I mean, Nick Calabrese, Frank Calabrese Jr. is still out there, but uh, Nick Calabrese, he died of natural causes. He was not, he was 80 years old or 81 years old. And um, they never got him. The mob never got him. And so... You know, the thing that the, the question I just want to pose is, is this the end for them? Like, are they really, are they really done? Like, is the Chicago outfit really dead? Um, personally, I think while there may be still be a few guys who were like connected and doing some stuff here and there, for all practical purposes, I would say yes. You know, uh, I would say it's, it's pretty much dead. Um, and this guy, you know, the kind of stuff that he was testifying about and that he was doing, I don't know if you could get away with stuff like that today with the technology and everything that they have today, that's highly unlikely. Like some of this stuff would be very difficult to even do. So, you know, the government beat him. That's the way I look at it. Uh, now I know in New York, you know, they still got stuff going on, but uh, they're bringing in guys from Italy though, too, over there. I, I think in Chicago it's dead. And personally, you know, I was born in a, in a heavy mob neighborhood. Like I, I mentioned to you guys, the Elmwood Park crew, for those of you guys who are new on the channel, I'm originally from, Chicago, but like the border of Chicago and Elmwood Park. I'm right from Harlem Avenue and diversity. Harlem Avenue is like the, it's like the dividing line. Um, and that's like the, in between Chicago and Elmwood Park. It's right there. I've showed that neighborhood in several videos. Um, that's where I was born. And a lot of my neighbors, you know, they were involved in that. I was just a little guy, so I didn't know anything was going on. But, um, you know, my dad would tell me about it later and stuff. And, you know, when I heard about what had happened to my neighbor, that just, it, it was like, it took the whole mask off the thing. You know what I'm saying? Cause guys act like family, guys act like they love each other and stuff. And then they'll turn around and whack one of the same guys that they just, you know, told them they love them uh, because of, you know, the boss told them to do this. And the boss might be a guy that they don't even get to see, you know, like on a daily basis or sometimes ever. Like the boss might be a guy you never even get to talk to. And he tells you, you've got to whack this guy that you see every day. You see his kids every day. You know his wife personally. You go to, you know, your families go together to soccer games with, with your kids and, you know, football games together. And you do all this stuff together every day. And then some guy that neither one of you even ever gets to see tells you that you got to whack this guy. And you're looking at him like, this guy's my brother. This, this guy's my family. Like, I, I hang out with this guy all the time. And the only thing they can say to you is, well, good. It, it makes it easier for you to get close to him. You know, he'll trust you. So you can shoot him in the back of the head. You know what I'm saying? And it, to me, I was like, man, this is cr like, there's no way. Like this, this whole thing is, is just goofy to me. That Italian beef thing, um, you know, and I'm not saying this like to, to single them out because all organized crime does this. The street gangs, like the, the cliques today, um, it's not so much like that. You're not taking orders from somebody that you don't even ever get to see. Like nobody's taking orders from anybody. So... Uh, some of these guys, you know, they do hang out with the same guys every day. And then um, as long as everybody, they, they'll start beefing over stuff, but it's not because of somebody gave an order for something, you know what I'm saying? But uh, like me, me personally, man, like I just, uh, that whole thing to me is like the definition of foo-foo, man. Overall, I can say, I, I think it's been a, I think it's been a, a negative. What's sad to me, man, I know a lot of like guys, especially guys from like, you know, the area of the city where I grew up in kind of look at it through rose colored glasses, you know, kind of uh, glamorize or whatever, like some, sometimes like Hollywood does. And like when you actually know the people, like personally that are involved in like getting whacked and stuff, there ain't nothing glamorous about this, bro. Um, some of the movies were a little realistic as far as some of the stuff, but even those, like it doesn't show how dirty a lot of it really gets. So um, yeah, anyways, man, that's my two cents, but let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Oh man, is the Chicago outfit dead? I think personally, like for the Italian community as a whole, you know, just growing up around them, I think honestly, it's a good thing that, 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 that it's dead. You know, honestly, like I think 
the mafia dying would be a, a good thing. There was an Italian journalist who wrote an article. Uh, he was like in a journalist or an author or something about like the effect, the long-term effect that the mafia had had on Italy and how Italy was like one of the top countries, you know, in Europe and would be one of like the leading countries if it wouldn't have been for, you know, all the, the organized crime holding it back. And I feel like that's, that's the case with a lot of, um, that's the case with a lot of communities that get involved in that stuff, you know, or like that they, they, they give that kind of activity fertile ground to flourish. It ends up holding it back. Any form of evil, I feel like does that. It, it just uh, becomes like a spider web that then the community can't get out of and uh, entangles everybody in it in some way, shape or form um, and takes a lot of innocent lives with them. But uh, anyways, man, let me know what you guys think in the comments section, man. But when you see the report, I'm out.